Hello folks, hope everybody had a glorious Halloween. We are back today to revisit a subject I have discussed before, and that is the topic of low-level laser light therapy for hair loss. Now, the last time I covered this therapy was in my video where I reviewed the iRestore, which was being promoted by Connor Murphy, and this video should be considered a follow-up to that video as it goes over a lot about what I think about laser therapy in general, but to sum up my opinion, I pretty much think they're garbage, and I'll go ahead and link that video below so you guys can get my original take on lasers, but as for Connor Murphy himself, I'm not going to say much about him as I'd rather have my teeth pulled than watch any of his terrible content, but all I really know about him is that he makes, or at least he used to make, a lot of really cringy videos on YouTube where he would pay attractive women to pretend to be interested in him and put up with his shenanigans and terrible personality, and he proved to the world that it's possible to look good and still be a complete incel. And he has also created some really, really terrible videos about hair loss where he promotes the blood flow, or excuse me, the blood flow theory, but in Connor Murphy's case, I think he isn't really trying to be deceptive, rather he just leg legitimately doesn't know anything better about the subject. Uh, that being said though, I don't want to be too mean because I heard he had a mental breakdown, but the underlying point is that I was extremely negative in my review of his iRestore laser helmet he was promoting, but as it turns out though, there has been some new data released recently, and uh, some of my viewers have asked that I take a second look at lasers as a therapy for hair loss and whether or not any of this new data may make me a little less critical towards laser therapy in general, and of course, I am happy to do so. So, what we have is a review article of 10 different randomized control trials that was released in July of this year, 2020, and that's after I posted my iRestore video. I think I made that one back in uh, June or May, but anyways, let's go ahead and dive balls deep into this beast of an article and see if we can disseminate fact from fiction so we can decide once and for all whether or not laser treatment should, under any circumstances, be included in part of a hair loss prevention stack. So. Like I said, this is a very big review article that covers 10 randomized control trials which examine 8 different de devices for administering low-level laser light therapy, including the iRestore, which was the subject of my last video on the topic. But in addition to that, though, we also have several different laser caps, including the Capillus and the iGro. We also have the Notorious Hairmax laser comb, and I say Notorious because I remember this gimmick was really advertised uh, extremely heavily on hair loss forums back in the day, and it was so advertised that it became impossible to view the forums without installing an ad block. It even had those really terrible uh, pop-up ads that first appeared in the 90s and early 2000s. I mean, it was that bad. But anyways, most of the studies on the various uh, devices reached similar conclusions, so I'm not going to go over every study individually in great detail, as it would be a waste of time. But what I want to do is look at the cumulative data on all the research, as well as look at some of the nuances and some of the individual studies that have some unique controls in place. Like, for example, one of the studies actually compares the iGro, which is a laser helmet, to 5% minoxidil. I mean, I think that should yield some interesting data as it is, is it, it is an examination of not just whether or not laser therapy is effective, but also an examination of how effectively it compares to existing clinically proven treatments, which is important since the cost of these devices, these devices is exorbitantly high, usually within the range of several hundred or even over $1,000, and the cost of medical therapy is much, much cheaper when we're talking about things like minoxidil and finasteride. So... Let's first start with an overview of the 10 studies. The number of patients in the various studies range from as few as 40 to as many as 110. And additionally, three-tenths of the studies include men and women, two of the studies include only women, and the remaining studies focus only on men. All the studies enrolled patients with male or female pattern baldness, although not every one of the studies specifies the severity, but the ones that do list Norwood or Ludwig scales ranging from one to five. The age range of all the patients range from 18 years old all the way to up to 70 years old in one study, but all the studies had decent sample sizes and diversity as well as controls in place to make sure the outcome of the research wasn't influenced by any factors not accounted for in the study, such as the patients being on finasteride. And like I said, there was only one study where another therapy was used, which was 5% minoxidil. So the frequency of the lasers used ranged from 635 to 660 nanometers, and that's important to know because it shows that even though 
though many different laser treatments are on the market, they're all pretty much the same. One exception though was a study that combined a 655 nanometer wavelength laser with an 808 nanometer infrared laser using a laser scanner. So even though the devices were similar, the actual treatment was varied in the different studies in the sense that the frequency of use as well as the duration of use was quite different across the board. This is to be expected just due to the nature of some of these devices, like for instance the Hair Max laser comb is literally just a comb with lasers on it as opposed to a helmet. I mean you use it by combing it through your hair as you would any other comb, but as a result of that the lasers will not be on the same region of the scalp for the same duration compared to say something like the Capillus, which generates lasers all over the scalp continuously as long as you continue to wear it. Also, even amongst the hat-like laser devices, the frequency varied just as a result of how the studies were designed. So to give you some reference, the duration of use varied from as few as, as little as a few minutes to as long as 30 minutes, and the frequency of use varied from as much as once per day to as few as three times per week. The duration of these studies lasted from a minimum of 16 weeks up to 26 weeks, with, uh, 26 weeks, with the latter being pretty similar to the duration of other hair treatments that have been studied. Uh, for instance, Clascoterone, the upcoming FDA-approved topical antiandrogen for hair loss, has studies which are done on subjects for up to six months. So for the control groups, they used uh, sham devices that looked like the real devices and would put out just a red-tinged light, but they didn't include lasers, just some glow that fooled the subjects. So the results of the studies were assessed in general by triggergrams, which as you guys know is effectively a microscope which can be used to measure exact hair counts. So it's more effective than a patient or an investigator assessment since the naked eye can't measure hair count as well as a microscope. That being said, most of the studies also included patient and investigator assessment of hair growth as well. So, so far this setup looks pretty good. We've got good sample sizes with populations diverse in age, gender, and hair loss severity. Uh, we have a large number of studies to test the reliability of the treatment, and we have a good tools in place to measure hair count. In addition, we have all the proper controls in place to make sure the results aren't skewed by external factors such as the patients already being on treatments for hair loss like minoxidil and finasteride. So, let's look at the results of all these studies and see what we can make of them. So in general, even though there were some different methodologies in place, the studies all showed objective signs of significant hair growth with low-level laser light therapy, including increased hair count and thickness compared to the placebo. So since the results uh, across all studies were similar, let's delve into just a couple of them in more detail. The first one I want to review is the one on the iRestore, since I think it's fair I give it another shot since I absolutely tore it to shreds in my last video. I also wanted to include it because it was the one of the more comprehensive of the 10 individual studies. So this individual study on the iRestore included 100 subjects who were male and female aged 25 to 60 and were all suffering from androgenic alopecia ranging from Norwood 2 to 5 for the male patients and a Ludwig scale of 1 to 2 for the female patients. And for those who don't know, the Ludwig scale is like the Norwood scale, as in it measures the severity of hair loss, but in the case of the Ludwig scale, it examines the pattern which is more commonly associated with women, even though it is possible for men to suffer this pattern as well, as well as for women to suffer a pattern more traditionally associated with male pattern baldness. So in this study, they didn't use the iRestore that is commercially available. Rather, they used a specialized version of it that gave treatment to only one half of the scalp so they can compare the results to both sides. This is pretty interesting because by doing this, they were effectively making the subjects both a control and treatment group in one. So all the patients were treated for 30 minutes per day, three times per week for 24 weeks. The results showed that the side of the head treated with laser therapy had significantly improved hair coverage, hair thickness, and hair count compared to the other side of their scalp that basically got nothing. There were some adverse effects in 29 of the 100 patients that are worth mentioning, and that included eczema, which is basically just a skin rash, and some of them also got, got itchy scalp and acne, although it's hard to say if these were just natural pre-existing issues with the patients or if they were influenced through the use of this laser device. But in any case, most of the sides resolved within two weeks, and none of them were so severe that any of the subjects had to drop out of the study, so I don't think it's very important. Interestingly, though, although there was objective evidence of hair growth in this study, 
there was no difference in the subject's assessment in their own hair growth or satisfaction between the two sides of their head. So I always prefer objective evidence, but if the results are so minimal, I can't even notice it in the, in the mirror, chances are I'm not really going to give a damn about any of the results I get. I mean, it's also interesting that most of the other studies in this article showed improved hair growth, but no difference that the subjects could perceive. I mean, it's funny because I've known a lot of people who have tried laser therapy. I mean, I've even tried it myself and very seldom do I hear people report any improvement. I mean, people usually say that they don't no notice any improvement at all. However, like I said earlier, the study does claim there was objective improvements in hair count that were statistically significant, even if the patients didn't notice them. So let's take a look at the photo trigogram tool that was used to measure exact hair count and see what it discovered. So on the side of the head that was treated with the laser treatment, there was a 14.2% increase in hair growth, which sounds pretty substantial until you look at the untreated side, which saw a 11.8% increase in hair growth. So basically, there was only a 2.4% difference between the two sides. So even though this may be statistically significant, that doesn't mean the results were cosmetically significant. They were just different enough that they could be measured to the point where, where you could tell that something was going on, even if that's something wasn't anything too impressive. But in the end, if the difference is so small that you can't even tell the difference when you look in the mirror, does it really matter? I mean, let's put this into perspective for a bit so you guys can judge for yourself. The average human scalp has anywhere from 110 to 150,000 hairs. Since 11.8% since of the hair growth was likely due to just to a natural antigen hair growth cycle since they weren't getting any treatment on one side of the scalp, we can determine that this study showed the laser's improved hair count by just 2.4%. That means after 24 weeks of treatment, the patient saw roughly an increase in just about 2,000 to 3,000 hairs. That is pretty pathetic. I mean, even the study on stomoxidine showed that it grew about 4,000 hairs after three months, and that is widely considered to be inferior to even 2% minoxidil. So to further demonstrate this and just how poorly laser therapy compared to existing clinical remedies, let's take a look at 2% and 5% minoxidil's results from the clinical studies on minoxidil done when the drug was undergoing FDA approval in the 1980s. So, on average, 2% minoxidil increased hair counts by 20 hairs per square centimeter, and 5% minoxidil increased hair count by 26 hairs per square centimeter. The human scalp has a surface area of about 650 square centimeters, so that translates into an increase in hairs from 2% minoxidil of 13,000 hairs, and in the case of 5% minoxidil, the increase is 16,900 hairs. So, if hair growth stimulants were the equivalent of Dragon Ball Z characters, let's say, then that means 5% minoxidil would be the equivalent of ultra instinct Goku and low level laser light therapy would just be Yamcha. Even if we accept the results of the studies in the review article, it hardly matters because the results are pitiful, especially for such an expensive treatment that requires up to 30 minutes of daily usage. It's just not worth it in my opinion. But since we're on the subject of minoxidil, let's look at the only study done which directly compares 5% minoxidil to the iGrow laser helmet. This study enrolled 45 females with female pattern hair loss who were aged anywhere from uh, 25 to 49 years old. The subjects were divided into three groups. One group got topical minoxidil 5% twice daily, which is the standard dose, and they were given that for four months. And one group got the iGrow uh, iGro treatment for 25 minutes every other day for four months. And the third group got both treatments at the same time. So what they used to evaluate hair count and hair thickness was an ultrasound biomicroscope and also a folloscope, which is basically similar to a phototrichogram. They also used investigator assessments of patient photos after two months and four months of treatment. So looking first at the clinical results, overall there was an improvement in the Ludwig scale in all three groups compared to baseline, though there appeared to be more improvement in the group that received a combination of minoxidil plus laser therapy compared to the other groups. Looking at the microscopy results, there was no significant difference in hair follicle diameter in any of the groups, but in terms of hair count, there was an increase in hair count in all three groups, though the increase with minoxidil was surprisingly not statistically significant. Nevertheless, when looking at the fall scope, the increase in hair count was statistically significant for all three groups. There appeared to be the best results when using minoxidil plus the laser treatment, but there were only minor differences in the results between the groups. For example, the fall scope showed a hair density at four months of 192 uh, hairs per square centimeter with minoxidil and 207 hairs per square centimeter 
nanometer with minoxidil plus laser. Unfortunately, this study uh, had no true control group, so it's difficult to say what the effects of treatment relative to uh, no treatment are in this study. Nevertheless, like most of the studies we have seen so far, it does look like laser therapy may have a small benefit, though I have to say it looks like minoxidil is really underperforming the study uh, compared to the published data from the FDA-approved clinical trials. I mean, remember, this is only a small study of women with no control group, and it only lasted for four months. I mean, that's a pretty short time frame, especially since oftentimes people will not even see the results of their treatment after four months. I mean, oftentimes it can take six months or even longer. I mean, in my case, it took me about 10 months before I noticed any results from finasteride. Also, I think it would require a study larger uh, than 40 people to actually compare these therapies because in all likelihood, minoxidil would absolutely destroy laser therapy since we have FDA-approved clinical trials which prove that minoxidil is a very effective hair growth stimulant which regrows hair in the tens of thousands, whereas this study shows similar results to the other studies in this review article, and that is that laser therapy is minimally effective at best, only re regrowing about 2,000 to 3,000 hairs, which is why even though there was a statistical difference noticed through tools like a falloscope, there was no noticeable cosmetic effect, which is really what matters since hair loss is, after all, a cosmetic issue. So I think so far, the justification behind laser therapy as a viable treatment seems like pretty thin gruel when we have cheap, generic, uh, clinically proven treatments like finasteride and minoxidil, which are widely available, and also blow laser therapy away in terms of effectiveness. Also, take note that even though this review article has 10 studies, None of them compare laser therapy to finasteride, and that is interesting because finasteride is the gold standard for long-term hair loss treatment. Uh, speaking of which, we also have no idea how well these laser treatments would hold up in the long term as the data only goes up to about six months or so. So, for as, so as far as we know, um, these results would peak and we may even lose ground after enough time has passed. So there's no guarantee that an investment in a laser helmet or a laser comb would hold its value after longer than a year or so. And that's assuming the thing doesn't even break before a year. So, at the conclusion of the review article, the authors note that many of the studies in the review have a clear relation with the industry, meaning industry either f sponsored the study or they were involved in evaluating the results. So this clearly indicates a conflict of interest as the researchers have a vested interest in seeing that the results are skewed a certain way. And considering that this was the best they can do, I'm really not impressed with the results. They also note again that despite some objective evidence of hair growth, most studies Studies showed no subjective improvement in hair growth or patient satisfaction, and ultimately, I think that's pretty important since if we can't see the results, why does it really matter? So anyways, laser treatments have been on the market for a long time. I mean, I even went to a clinic that specialized in laser hair therapy uh, back when I was first losing ground in my early 20s, and after several months, I can safely say it didn't do squat. I mean, maybe if they used a folloscope or phototrichogram, they would have been able to demonstrate minuscule results, but in the end, why should it matter? matter if something gives results if none of the results are cosmetically significant. With minoxidil and finasteride, I can safely say in all certainty that my results were cosmetically significant, as in they stopped my hair loss and they even gave me some regrowth. And my story is corroborated by hundreds of millions of dollars worth of clinical trials because after all, we are talking about finasteride and minoxidil, which are the only two FDA approved treatments for hair loss. So does any of this new data change my mind about laser therapy? Well, assuming the industry bias behind the studies didn't skew the results too much, I guess I can conclude that maybe laser therapy could help a very, very small amount but does that justify the expense, the time, and the downright inconvenience of using such a product? Hell no, especially since we have such great alternatives on the market. Now, I have heard people claim lasers have worked re really, really well for them, and who knows, maybe there is a very small subset of the population who respond extremely well to the treatment, but for every positive anecdote I have heard about lasers, I have heard at least 10 other people saying it didn't do a damn thing for them, so that's a gamble I don't think is worth it. So look, I know people are getting tired, they're getting frustrated of having so few options when it comes to hair loss, but the fact remains that finasteride and minoxidil are the gold standard for treatment. They work extremely well, the side effects are rare, mild, and often will go away on their own with continued use, and they will always go away upon discontinuation. Many manufacturers of alternative treatments and alternative medicines will prey upon our fears by misleading us about the proven safety profile of these drugs because they know they can't compete with them on efficacy. 
efficacy. I mean, we do have some promising treatments on the horizon, such as Brizula, as well as some more obscure ones that need a lot more research, like Cetipiprint. Uh, but for now, as of 2020, if you're looking to start the fight against hair loss and you're not willing to at least look at using finasteride, then good luck, because you're really going to need it. So with that, uh, that's I think that's about all I have to say on the subject. So I'm going to go ahead and play some Doom Eternal and make sure you vote. Take care.